Where were we? We were somewhere like about... Ve'inyanu. Where's the ve'inyanu? Ken, ve'day kol lo haya ki mal derech ze lafoch meriru lemitka. So, the whole purpose of life, as we said, is to transform the bitterness into sweetness. Or in other words, to always look at the bright side of life. Oh. To quote Monty Python. Meaning, in other words, to to reveal godliness in everything. That's really what it what it means. You know that we talked about yesterday with that story. So the famous statement that the harsh judgments are sweetened at their core, at their root. What does that mean? Dine, a person needs to know that kol ra'ot v'dinim rachmana litzlan. All the hardship, the negative things, all the harsh judgments that have come into the world, shorsham u'mekoram u'mechayeh otam utov. Their source that sustains them and gives them their existence is actually good. The source itself is not negative. The source of their energy, where they take their energy from, is not negative. Zohar gives the mashal, the famous parable, that the king had a son who he wanted to test, and he sent a harlot to try to seduce him. Hmm? Entice him. Entice him. I guess in England it's entice. In, in, in America it's seduce. Yes, you have to be seduced. Yeah, it is. That really what she wants is that, the, is that the king's son not fall for her seduction, for her enticement, for her charms. She wants to fail. And she'll have more joy from failing than she will from succeeding. Because the king will love her for having done her job, but he will love her even more for having failed. <laughs> but if she, God forbid, is successful, and she's able to seduce him, then she's going against the will of the king, the real will. The real will was that his son withstand the test. And this was said by the sages in the Gemara, that the angel of the evil inclination and Pnina, who gets a bad rap all the time, but I guess, I guess that's her lot, Pnina was the wife of Elkanah, the, the, the second wife. He had two wives. Elkanah and Chana. What did she do to entice the Satan? Uh, she didn't entice the Satan. She constantly beleaguered and badgered her, oh. her Tzara, her, 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 the other woman, oh. Chana. And she kept badgering her so much so that Chana was bitter all the time. But the bitterness was turned into sweetness. That, and, and it was terrible because because of her badgering, she had seven children, and she lost them all. And Chana had seven children in her place after many years of being barren. So she's, she's always somehow grouped together with the evil inclination that really the reason she badgered her was to see how she would respond, not to really uh, demean her. That wasn't the purpose. And what happened? That the more she demeaned Chana, the more Chana prayed to Hashem. The more she took it as a sign that Hashem wants my prayers. And she didn't turn it into bitterness in the sense of, in the sense of, uh, of uh, woe is me that I don't have anything. That's not how she saw things. It's very interesting that uh, she came to, to El Kana with the same, call it, complaint 
that Rachel did. Lam, give, me give me children. And what did what did ya, what did Yaakov say? Atachat elokim ani ki atenach banim. Am I instead of God that I can give you children? But Elkanah said something entirely different. He said, Tov ani lach me'asara banim. I my 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 myself is better for you more than ten children. So it begs the question. They asked for the same thing. Why did Rachel? Receive such a very cold response from her husband, am I instead of God? And Hannah received such a beautiful response, and I'm better than uh, him. So that's called the that's called the sweetening of the judgments. Meaning, how does a person see that he sweetened the judgments? He sees it from the response of those around him. And he sees that people around him. Um, uh, again, he could have a constant source of pain, but if the complaint is not a complaint, but rather a, a, a yearning to strive higher, then you see that at some level reality smiles at you. That, that was her smile. The, her husband said this to her. Amru ובמקום אחר אמרו, נתן עיניו במקדש ראשון והחריבו, משמע שנתקנה בו. And the Gemara also says that the Satan, uh, he looked at the first temple, he put his eyes into it, meaning he, he stared at it, and he saw how good it was for the Jewish people, and he destroyed it. Meaning, in other words, that he was uh, jealous of it. Why? Why is why is this uh, why is this uh, temple existing? In other words, that depending on how a person looks at something, that has the power to either elevate it or make it fall. Make or break. The Rebbe said this a lot of times in respect to Mashiach. He said that the only job we have is to open our eyes. What he meant, you know, um, I don't know why he didn't say it openly, but what he meant very clearly was that it all depends on how you look at things. That if you decide that you want to look at things in a positive light, then you'll bring Mashiach. Because that's all that's left. It's your perspective. There's nothing more that's needed. It's just how you're going to look at things. You can destroy the temple just by looking at it with jealousy. You can destroy worlds just by looking at them with jealousy. And the issue here is, Like we said, that the life force that's giving evil its life is itself good. Can there be a servant who completely rebels against his master? So we can find maybe that amongst people there can be such a thing that an actual servant will rebel against his master. But that's only because really when you're flesh and blood you feel separate. You feel that you're even if even if you're being supported by the master, you're you're receiving. Today we would say, would a worker rebel against his uh, company? So even though you're receiving your livelihood from the company, yes, it happens. Why? Because in the end, a person can imagine that I can receive my life force somewhere else. I have other options. I'm separate. I'm not totally dependent. It's a big world. You can find somewhere else to to get your livelihood from. But those who are true servants of God, So, how could somebody who's, or something that is completely dependent on God, and is a, is a, is a total servant of God, suddenly rebel against Him? He gives life to everything. Where are you going to go? <laughs> you can't go somewhere else. 
this is what you have. We're talking here about the evil inclination, for instance. So they answered, the Mishane, they answered, uh, that this is like the parable of the harlot with the king's son. That really, she has no interest in seducing him. She has no interest in going against the king's will. So the only thing that's really giving life to even the most terrible things that are happening is godliness. In the end, it's all good. And its root above is good. Know that once it comes down into our world, into the world where you cannot see the source, you just see the evil for what it is, you can't see where it's coming from. So in our world, it looks like true evil and absolute harsh, absolutely harsh judgment. This is the same whether it's in material problems or spiritual problems. It's all the same. Therefore, when a person has some kind of, of uh, suffering, God forbid, so our, the way to overcome it is to think is to the external picture of how it seems but rather to see it as it is above that's that's the real trick that its root is good because from Hashem there's nothing no bad. evil that comes out no bad only total goodness Except that for now it doesn't have a vessel down here and we can't see the source. And therefore what we see is only the external aspect which is negative. So that's really the, the way, and, 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 and he right away quotes here, again, the two sources for this in the Tanya are, are Perik Avav, where he says that all, all the all the negative things that uh, are in our world are only because there's no vessel to contain the good down here. There are no eyes to see it. But the source of everything, the source of everything is in godliness, and therefore, really, everything is good. And secondly, the very difficult Igeret Hakodesh Yudalef, the eleventh epistle. Where he also says the same thing. So there he says it uh, even more in, in a harder way. It's a it's a very tough igera to learn because uh, because really, um, in this sense, Chassidus teaches people to close their eyes. That you can't believe everything you see, or you you have to assume that there's a hidden dimension behind what what we're experiencing. And that that's the real, the real um, test in life. What he's saying is, and I think this is very important, is uh, he says that by doing this, you 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 sweeten the judgments at their source. I Meaning, you see that in the in the. It's almost like. A person wants to build a home. And in, in his plan, he, he makes a detailed plan. But he doesn't realize that the plan is abstract. And when he actually comes to, to break ground, to start digging the, the foundation of his house and this and that, suddenly he comes across all kinds of problems. And it can be so big, he says, why in the world did I even want to start this? Uh, I don't need this. What a headache. So what happened? It's not that the plan was wrong. The plan's good. It's 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 a, it's a decent and good plan. The problem is that the ground is not ready for it. The reality doesn't have vessels where it is to contain this type of uh, plan. 
The plan is too, is, is, is just vesselless. It's, it can't be, it's a bad investment in the, in the sense that you can't make vessels for it. You can't make vestments for it. You can't make a, a clothing for it. So it doesn't make the plan bad. The plan remained good. So that's why the dinim nitkanim uh, b'shorsham is always related to bina, meaning that's why it's called laskilcha bina. That's why he called that pistol. He started with the with the pasuk laskilcha bina tam vadat. It's a, a continuation, but first of all bina. And bina is to understand that the plan is a good plan. It's to understand that it's meant to give me goodness but I don't have the vessels. So let's say a person starts digging and he finds that, wait a minute, in Eretz Yisrael he finds out that he's got solid rock, like a, a foot under, under, under the ground. You, know, you didn't know that, that, that that's what the ground was like there. So he has to bring in heavy equipment to start breaking the, the rock down. So the same thing is true in life. Because we're not looking, we don't need to. We don't have heavy equipment that we need to bring in. What we need to do is do something that's a vessel spiritually. So that's why bringing in these spiritual vessels a lot of times helps the plan come through, and the goodness suddenly appears. It's the same idea. So you bring in something new that you didn't have until now. You didn't figure it in your plans. You didn't realize it was going to cost this much. But so yeah, if you, if you don't want to get stuck in the middle. If you don't want to get stuck in the middle of life, if you don't want to give up on, on, on the plan, you have to figure out what kind of vessel you can you bring in. Huh? You have to break down the walls. Okay, so so in physical matter, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's this big heavy equipment. In spiritual matters, which is, again, it's the same thing. A person's health or whatever that suddenly is, is breaking down, so the, the thing he needs to do is to add heavy equipment. What's the heavy equipment? Ah, he learns uh, five minutes of uh, chumash every day. He learns ten minutes of tanya, uh, this or that. <coughs> and over time it breaks down the barriers and he creates the vessels <coughs> that are needed in order to uh, let the plan come out. So that's, that's why he calls it laskilcha bina. It's, it's to teach you about how bina works. The Bina is the attempt to bring reality to a higher level, but it's only a plan. And reality itself is not so uh, cooperative all the time. That's what he says. When, when you come to Ishtaushalus, when it comes down, it's not always, in, not always ready for it. So that, that's, the whole, that's, the whole, uh, that's the whole trick. Not to give up on the fact that this is really good. That's the toughest part. That Hashem means good. Everything is well-meaning. <coughs> the problem is that the reality is not ready for it yet. So it all depends on opening the eyes. Opening the, the eyes to what? Opening the eyes to the possibility, and not just the possibility, but to the inevitability that reality will reveal how it's a vessel for goodness. That that's what reality really wants. Also, this this piece of er, of of uh, this lot that I bought is yearning for my house. My sight, my point of view, my perspective to get it ready. And once it's ready, it'll be the best building ever. So that that is what he means by that. It's all de it all depends on on how you look at things. It's not it's not to be stupid. If, you, if a person just ignores it and says, okay, well, you know, you can't, can't dig, uh, you know, I don't know, five meters down here, so we'll just build on top of the, the solid rock. <laughs> that house is not going to stand. You have to, you have to acknowledge the fact that there's a solid piece of rock here. You have to acknowledge the fact that there's evil. Again, uh, evil for the time being. You can't ignore it. And you have to figure a way how you're going to break it down. So you bring in the, maybe the equipment. Under, maybe under the rock is oil. What? Maybe under the rock is oil. Who knows? And I don't think you're going to build a house there. <laughs> okay. Vezehu, vezehu nikra meich ladakik. 
שהוא באמת חיותו יתברך. So this is called the thin, the key, because like thin, the thin uh, food that really is the sustenance that Hashem is constantly giving everything in order to keep it going. So the same is true even about the negative things, that they have a mechla dakik, they have a thin conduit of divine sustenance that's keeping it alive. וזהו בכל מאודך, and this is what it means with all your might. כמאמר טוב מאוד, טוב זה מלאך החיים, מאוד זה מלאך המוות, and מאודך is like very good, the very, the very, the more, the, the additional. This is all what we call the angel of, here he says, חיים. כן, טוב זה מלאך החיים, טוב זה אנג'ל אוף לייף, and very is the angel of death. Why? שהוא טוב מאוד בלי שיעור גבול. כן. Because to say very good is to go beyond limits. And that, that's what we said. That's the main, that's the main teaching uh, regarding uh, the negative. That all of life is about breaking through the barriers. Breaking through the ground. Being able to construct something that's very good. And very means going beyond my limits. Going beyond what I can... What, what, what is natural, as it were, for me. Where are we? Eshadai lo bali dei gilui veno musag. Anything that's limitless cannot be invested, cannot be put into garments, into vessels. So you have to build the proper vessels for it. The moment that you build the proper vessels for it, then it will be revealed. But it's like to understand that all the energy in the world is all good. <clears throat> it's just that it doesn't have a vessel yet. That's why it's so, uh, it's so uh, exciting to certain people that science has figured out that there must be like 95% dark energy. I used to think it was dark mass. And now I it's just dark it's energy. Dark energy. It's energy that we don't have any vessels to measure. We only know about it, um, uh, what do you call uh, in, uh, the, uh, not inadvertently, it's the wrong word. Uh, the whole okay. accidentally. No, we only know about it, not directly, but indirectly. There's certain measurements about the universe that force us to say that there must be a lot more energy than what we see. So that's great. If there's a lot more energy than what we see. That's exactly what we're saying. That this energy doesn't yet have vessels. But when it'll have vessels, it'll be, it'll be revealed. And energy is always, is always the source of life. It means that there's more life than we think there is. Say it another way, that life is, as it were, always fighting against entropy, against you know, the breakdown of things. But if there's a ton more energy than what we think, there's 95% more than what we think, then everything we've defined until now as a, as a fight against entropy, eh, forget about it. It has no more meaning, because there's so much energy. That even if we'll go through the regular entropy, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be finished with what can be done for 95 magnitudes of order higher in terms of time. But to go back to your mashal of building the house, hmm. maybe you're in the wrong plot. Maybe you're not supposed to be there. So that, there you have to believe that if this is what you bought, this is your lot in life. That, that what Hashem wants for you is to dig the house. Yeah, but maybe you didn't <coughs> get the beforehand. Sorry? Maybe you didn't ask Hashem, you know, maybe you didn't, you just went ahead and did it without thinking. Yeah, that's what we say that. That's how life is. <laughs> there was a dialogue with Hashem. I'm not saying that you go, you went and you did uh, some avera. And now you want to uh, salvage it. You know, you went and did something normal that everybody does. And for you, it's difficult. So this is where your test is: Are you going to see reality as begging to be good? It just needs the vessels to 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 reveal it. Or are you going to look at it with a, with a negative eye and say nothing can be salvaged here? There's nothing that can be done with this. It's not worth anything. There's a, 
Mark Boranov <laughs> told me an incredible thing. I, I think I knew it all the time, but I'd never heard it so clearly. He, you know, he's a very good mechanic. He's, he's really good with his hands. He rebuilt his car. He, mm -hmm. tra he totaled his car. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have insurance. He didn't even have a license. <laughs> but, Baruch Hashem, you know, Hashem gives you a lack in one area and he gives you something else in another one. He rebuilt it himself. Because uh, he didn't have insurance and went to Musaq and asked them how much he wanted. They always said like 60,000 shekels. Yeah, I forget. He did, the, he did the whole job for 25. Um, Imamish rebuilt uh, the whole car. Uh, he ordered parts from Chutzar to take him in. He, he borrowed tools. And, uh, he really did the, he did the whole thing. So it took him like a month and a half to get all the pieces and put it, and do it all and put it together. And, and in the process, you know, we were talking a lot about it and other things uh, about mecha about uh, musachim here in Israel. And uh, the more we talked about it, the more he got interested, and maybe that's what he should do. Because, you know, he, he does this stuff on the internet, but that's not... Uh, he, he needs to have satisfaction from his work. So he started, you know, his Hebrew is not great, but he started going around different musachim, and eventually he found a couple of people they could really talk to. And last week he made a tremendous discovery. He, he realized that nobody here is a mechanic. <laughs> there's a mechanic and there's a mechanic. In, in America, I guess the English-speaking world, the Western world, a mechanic is somebody who fixes things. In Israel, a mechanic is somebody who replaces things. It's different jobs altogether. It's only two different skills. <laughs> to fix things means you take it apart and, and you figure out what's wrong with it and you repair it. And usually when you repair it, you make it even better than it was before. Because obviously there was something, it could be that it was fine to begin with, but when you repair it, you can, you can, you can give it the attention it needs. And if it's not, you know, really torn down or whatever, worn down, you, you can actually make it better than it was before. And it's the original part, it's, it's what, the, what the, in this case, an automobile needs. The engine needs its original parts, that's what it works with. In Israel, they don't do that. They take it, up, they, they take it apart, they toss it out, and they tell you, you have to buy a new one. I'll give you, I'll give you a, not an OEM part, I'll give you a, like a, you know, Refurbished. Re, uh, re, uh, refurbished or whatever. Uh, no, some, some, some of the nonsense. Usually it's not refurbished. It's just from the non-original parts that they buy from China. So what do you get? You get a worse product in the end. Why? Because they don't want to spend the two hours figuring out what's wrong with it and actually fix it. They don't want to say, why, why? They charge you anyway for the two hours. It's as if they did, they did it anyway. They said, yeah, we checked it, we checked it. We can't fix it. So this guy, he, was, he became his friend. The mechanic really talked to him. He said, I, I don't fix anything. So beyond the fact that, I mean, it's stupid. It's really not the way you should do things, especially now with automobiles. Um, it also destroys the spirit. He, he made this very interesting observation. He said, the mechanics here are absolutely cynical about everything. They have, in the rest of the world, a mechanic or somebody who likes to use his hands and uses it, uses them, is, is, is full of satisfaction from his life. Because there's almost nothing more satisfactory than taking something broken and putting it back together and, and, seeing, and seeing somebody use it. There's almost nothing in the world that's, that's more satis satisfying than that. And here they're cynical because they don't do any of that anymore. All they do is they toss the part, bring me a new one, that's it. So the whole reason why they got into it, what, just to take something apart and put, it, put another one in? What am I, a robot? I mean, that's, that's what happens. And you kill the spirit in the person. So you can back down from these trials, from these 
tribulations from the fact that the rock is is what I hit after a foot and what am I going to do? But part of opening the eyes is to understand that sometimes there's extreme cases, but and if you can prevent it beforehand, maybe you should, but if you can't, this is where I am now, this is what I'm stuck with, to solve it is far more important for the spirit than to try to move somewhere else and try to try your luck somewhere else. It, it completely changes the outlook that because uh, 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 the other the other option is a defeatist attitude and the defeatist attitude in the end kills the spirit so when faced with these with these obstacles I mean the Rebbe the, that was the way the Rebbe saw everything is that you you can't leave just don't leave <laughs> do whatever you need to do but push forward don't don't give up because eventually the obstacles are going to fall because you're going to make the vessels you just have to make them and once you make vessels things fall into place and the satisfaction at the end is a thousand times more than if you would have given in and it would have been defeatist and would have said ah you know maybe i should just look for some some other place to to do my thing what time is it Time to go to Russia. Uh -huh. Okay, so we'll end here. And God willing, finish this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, on Thursday. Thursday.